There's an interesting statement they made there by uh, Moses in verse 19, uh, and he's telling the people, uh, of course, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole earth. is telling them that the sun, moon, and stars do not possess supernatural powers. And they do not control men's destinies as the signs of the zodiac suggests or as astrology suggests. It was an important lesson because they had lived in Egypt and stargazing and predicting by the stars and seeing the signs of the heavens was very important to the Egyptians in their religion and in their lives. And so he's telling the children of Israel, you're not to do what they do in this matter. The truth about the planets is they are simply witnesses to something greater than ourselves, and that is the creating God. How do I know that? We know that from Psalm 19. Where the psalmist, in looking at the stars and the heavens, came out with this psalm of praise with regard to God as he viewed these things. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there, are, are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its, his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So he's saying, look, all of the, the universe, as, we, as much as we can see of it anyway with our eyes, is a proclamation and a witness to God's existence, the Creator's existence. Of course, these uh, stars and that help man in other ways in that uh, we know it helps ships to navigate their course in the sea. Uh, we know they are given for times and for seasons. So we are not to serve the planets. They are there to serve us, and that by God's appointment. It is quite an amazing thing to think that the whole universe is for us. And the earth in particular is our domain. So let's look at God and astrology. Fundamental to our faith, and this is important for us to, to just hang on to, fundamental to our faith is that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 verse 1. It's a simple statement, but it's an enormous statement. It covers everything. God created everything. For this reason, we are to see God in these things, not just some other power or any other power for that matter. If we look at Isaiah 40 verse 26, Isaiah chapter 40. Mm. 
He says in verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. He says, you're impressed. You feel dwarfed by what you see up in the heavens as you look on high. Well, who created all of this? Our God created all of this. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ created all of this. And Jesus, of course, was the one through whom he created all these things. So we're, we're, we are thinking on uh, an enormous scale, almost an eternal scale in these terms. And his greatness and his power hold it all together. So when we come before God, we're not talking to some buddy or some lesser being than ourselves. We're talking about God Almighty. And we need to know that we're in the presence of God Almighty now. And we need to respect his almightiness, his power, his glory. His infinite wisdom. In every respect we need to just grasp what we're dealing with. Who we're dealing with. So don't look at the stars to think what are the signs of the zodiac today for me. What, what powers or what signs can I see in these heavens that will, uh, that will give me insight or understanding. That will uh, prevent me from getting myself into trouble. We're to think God and the creator. We know from Psalm 103, 19 and 20, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. It's in the heavenly realm that he set his throne, as it were. And his throne bespeaks of sovereignty. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Everything, everything, whether it's stars or planets or people or demons or angels, every created thing is subject to him and to his will. Because we can't see God and we can only know this by faith, our existence becomes a distraction. We're so into ourselves as if we were the universe, as if we were gods. But it's in him we live and we move and we have our being. We've got to recognize our dependence, our absolute dependence, so that we might be submissive in the way God wants us to be submissive. His sovereignty rules over all. Even the hosts of heaven serve him doing his will. There's a, there's a statement by God as he reasoned with Job about Job's lack of understanding of what he was criticizing because he was criticizing God. It was almost saying that God was unjust in the way he was treating him. And that he had been so righteous he didn't deserve this sort of treatment. But God shows him that I'm working on a higher level than you will ever understand. I am so far beyond what you think or what you do or what you are. That you need to recognize that making criticism of God is a dangerous business because we're too stupid to know what God is doing and why God is doing it. So let's look at Job 38. It's just before Psalms. Beginning with verse 31. 
He asks Job this question, and I'm putting it to you, because we, you need to be asked, and I need to be asked as well, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? This is a star system in the heavens. Or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Sure, even the scientists are struggling with this sort of thing. Well, can you do any of this? Were you there when God created in the first place? What do you know? Nothing. Where's all this pride of ours coming from? Nowhere. Except our own fanciful thoughts about ourselves. We're in the presence of God and we should be humbly grateful that he accepts us into his presence. All these things with regard to the, the universe, with regard to the solar system and the cosmos, these things God does and there is no one, not even the highest archangel, who has such almighty power and infinite <coughs> wisdom. Now sometimes when we're talking on, on that level, we start, because we're humans, we start to get scared. But it's reassuring to know that God's infinite power is not used whimsically. You know, on a whim when, oh, I want to do this, and, 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 and when we get it done, we're hurting people all over the place and we're being nasty and selfish and all the rest of it. That's not the way God works. In Psalm 48 verse 10 it says, As is your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Now his right hand represents his power. It denotes his power. So the exercise of his power is always according to righteousness. In other words, it's consistent with his nature, with who he is. It's consistent with every part of his character, his holiness, his goodness, his love, his justice. All of it, it's all harmonized harmonizes and everything that God does completely harmonizes with everything that he is. It is the standard by which he does everything. It's the standard by which he thinks and speaks. So God, the God of all the earth, will always do right. Unlike us, he will always do what is right, what is upright, what is good, what is just, what is fair in his dealings with us. So we've got no need to fear. And he says, even in your superstitious beliefs, and when there is superstition around, it is a fearful thing to live in a society and in a time where superstition rules. Now, in the West, we've, we've, got, uh, we've got clear of it now because of Christianity. And we've got run to the opposite extreme. But... In Africa and other places, superstition is, has a stranglehold on the people. And no matter how enlightened they become, scientifically and otherwise, no matter how learned they are, the superstition runs through the veins and through the societies and causes terror and paranoia among the people. 
So God says, do not learn the way of the nations and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3. You can imagine in a time of great crisis, and it was a time of great crisis when Jeremiah was preaching. It was a time of unbelief. It was a time when uh, there was threats from world forces against them as a people and wholesale slaughter going on all around them. <clears throat> and of course, everybody's looking for answers. Everybody's looking for powers to help uh, prevent what they see as inevitable or, uh, or give the strength for them to overcome it. And they're looking to the heavens for the signs. And then there's all sorts of bad signs that they see. And it just feeds into the fear factor and makes life worse for everybody. God has to tell his people, don't be afraid of the signs or the so-called signs of the heavens. Don't be afraid of them. So really, the children of God have nothing to fear from astro astrology or anything to do with the signs of the zodiac or anything of that nature whatsoever, the signs that they see in the heavens. And that's what Isaiah chapter 40, or what God is saying in Isaiah chapter 41, uh, as he tells them in verses 10 to 13, do not fear, for I am with you. Listen to this. When you're in society where everybody else is afraid, do not fear, he tells the Christian, I am with you. Do not be, or do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. That's where your faith has to kick in. That's where we get the strength from, where everybody else is losing heart, the hands are falling limp, they feel hopelessly despairing. We believe God is with us. God can protect us. There is nothing in the signs of the heaven, heavens that God is not in control of. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. For I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. We're afraid of so much in life, not just the stars of the heavens. The economic situation makes us frightened. When we have no jobs or we're threatened with being fired or something, we become fearful, frightened. When we try to preach the gospel and we're rejected, we become frightened. The devil has all sorts of ways of trying to scare us. But God says, don't be afraid. All right, let's move from astrology now and go into God and necromancy. Uh, I think that's the proper pronunciation. I don't know. Well, uh, somebody's bound to tell me whether it is or not anyway. Uh, necromancy is divining by supposed communication with the dead. Seances and other, other things. Uh, the, the glass on the table with everybody with their finger on it and it moves to letters and spells out a message from the dead all that sort of thing that goes on don't know if you've been involved in it but if you haven't you should know about it what this is all about is um, I think I, I can help explain it by turning to a passage in Deuteronomy 29.29 29. In 
Deuteronomy 29, 29, he says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. It's interesting, we've got all this revelation from God uh, that would uh, take a lifetime of study to plummet its depths. And instead of uh, being interested in that, we want to know about secret things. What's the secret things? What's the things hidden in the darkness? What's, well, why do we not have an answer for this? Why is this not the answer for that? We're all, we're all into uh, trying to find out what can't be found out. And it's these secret things that uh, are the impetus for calling up the dead and inquiring from the dead. It, it is the idea that the spirits of the dead or evil spirits have the power to know some of these secret things that gives rise to necromancy or to the seances or the talking to the dead. Men of the flesh who have turned away from God, try to harness the power of these spirits by getting information from them or by using the power of these spirits to change or control what is happening in the world. And of course, that's all for their own ends. I, I want to really emphasize though, it is men of the flesh, men or women who are not interested in God, not interested in the truth, not interested in the fact that God is the creating God, the maker of all things, and that he is a sovereign Lord over all things. They're not interested in that. They want to bypass that. I don't care about God. I don't want to know God. I just, I just want to know how I can get the most out of this life for myself. And if it takes speaking to the dead to do that, then I'm prepared to do it. Familiar spirits. People play around with it. Go to the gypsy, do you? Let her tell, your, um, tell you your fortune. Oh, come on, it's great fun. Let's, let's do it. Well, where is she getting her information from? Well, it's supposed to be a spirit that reveals these things to her. So, so it's, it's not just a select group. We, we are, uh, people read horoscopes in magazines and the paper. And they want to know, what's my horoscope for today? Well, what's this horoscope thing all about? It's about the signs of the zodiac being aligned in a certain way which is supposed to tell us that this is what's going to happen to you and that's what's going to happen to you. Of course, they're all being interpreted by some uh, man or woman who is making a living out of this thing. I'm not begrudging them making a living. I'm just saying they don't have to lie to people to be making a living. They could do an honest job for an honest wage rather than get into this hocus pocus. But they do and the people love it. They love it. I want to show you how impotent this, these things really are. And one of the best ways to do it is to go to Isaiah 57, 8 through 14. Isaiah 57. I think I've got the I think I've got the wrong place here. Um, yeah, I've put down the wrong scripture here. Uh, it's not coming to me, so 
I have to, I have to skip that one. I'll just move on to Balik. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what it was. Uh, it was uh, that the, the Babylonians, all their wise men, all their astrologers, all their magicians, and all their sorcerers could not ward off the power of God's retribution on their wickedness. They, you see, they, they became strong, they believed, through all of these magical arts, uh, through the, the power of their gods, through the wisdom of their wise men uh, and magicians, uh, and uh, they, they thought that uh, once they were paying homage to all of these things, that they would continue to be as strong and as powerful as they were, and that no one would ever move them. But the truth of the matter was that God said he was going to bring his retribution on them, and not the magicians, nor the astrologers, nor the wise men, nor anybody in Babylon could ward off God's determined purpose here because that is the reality. That was what was going to happen. And now that we can look back on that history, we can see that God was right and they were totally impotent against the power of God. Now that just should carry a great message for us. If they in the enormity of their commitment to all of these things, felt that their rise to power and their security in that power belonged to the darkness and the dark side of things. And they felt they would never be moved, that no one had the power. They had all the power and no one could move them. <coughs> They were not only moved, they were brought down and they were utterly destroyed because that's what God had determined to do because of their wickedness. So when you go to um, a medicine man, a zangoma, uh, 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 a shaman, a fellow who throws the bones or makes incantations or is to tell you the message that he's getting from the spirits as to what you should do to make yourself better or to ward off a curse that has been placed on you or whatever else. You've just got to understand all of this is hocus pocus. <coughs> there is no reality in it, no power in it whatsoever. It's only the superstition of people's minds and their commitment to it that makes it seem like it's alive and real and has some power behind it. It isn't there. Like I say, Balaam in the Old Testament, Numbers 22, he, he was, he was a, a huge personality. And if you talk about a superstar, this was the superstar of his day and his time. This was the man who had caught everybody's attention, the public as well as the kings in the surrounding nations. He was the idolater's prophet. And they believed he was a mighty prophet. Pa Balaam was paid by a king called Balak to curse Israel. But as great a, a prophet as Balaam seemed to be to his fellow idolaters, he was as clay in the potter's hand. Overwhelmed, Balaam spoke by the spirit to Balak, for there is no omen, this is not what he was paid to say, there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what God has done. And this is Numbers 23, 23. Now the lesson is clear. And the message is, as Isaiah 43, 13 says, even from eternity I am he, God says. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I act. Who can reverse it? 
That's what God says. I act. Who can reverse it? You see, the thing about God is he knows everything. In, in his foreknowledge, he knows all things. God, who knows all things, knows the message of the divination even before it's revealed. If you're still in Isaiah, go to 43 here. Let's hope I got the right one this time. Was it 47? Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Martin. Okay. 43 verse 13. That's Eve and I from eternity. That's, that's that one. Um, okay, the, the other one I'm looking for now is Ezekiel 21, verse 21. Here's God telling the children of Israel before this even happens what's going to happen and why it will be that the Babylonian army will decide to go down to Jerusalem and to ransack the place. It says, for the king of Babylon, Ezekiel, this is uh, Ezekiel 21, beginning with verse 21, for the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways, to use divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the household idols, he looks at the liver. Into his right hand came the divination, Jerusalem, to set battering rams, to open the mouth for slaughter, to lift up the voice with a, bat, uh, a battle cry, to set battering rams against the gates, to cast up mounds, to build a siege wall. And it will be to them like a false divination in their eyes. They have sworn solemn oaths, but he brings iniquity to remembrance that they may be seized. Actually, the, the reason why there's so much surprise from the uh, people of Jerusalem, and maybe from the Babylonians as well, is that they had entered into uh, a covenant relationship with each other after the first uh, sacking of Jerusalem and the taking away of people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and all of that. They'd signed a contract and the, the contract was that the king of Israel will continue to be a subject of the king of Babylon and pay of course the taxes that had been imposed and keep their laws and walk in their ways. But the king wasn't faithful to that covenant. In other words, he lied. And he started to negotiate with Egypt to see if Egypt would help him to fight against Babylon and to make them independent again. Now the Babylonians are on the way and they're, they're surprised that they're being told to go to Jerusalem to destroy it. But they can't go against the gods or the spirits because this is where they get all their information from. This is the ones or these are the ones to whom they are obedient. So they're told to go. Well, how did God know before it ever happened? How did he know? Because he knows all things. That's how he knew. And isn't that a comfort for you? You think you're taken by surprise by something that happens in your life. It's a setback. And you think, I'll never recover from this. This is just the worst nightmare of my whole life. I, I can't see it ever happening that I could be so, so crushed by what's, what's taken place and so helpless before it. And then you have to say to yourself, but God knew all along. God knew all along. He's telling me not to fear these situations. He's telling me I'm with you. I'll help you. I'll deliver you. I'll protect you. He's telling me, I've allowed this to happen to you in order either to teach you a lesson, to discipline you, to instruct you, 
to make you stronger in your resolve to trust me and to do what is right in the face of all adversary. adversary. He's trying to encourage us to see there's a positive outcome for all of those who trust God in all circumstances. And more especially in those circumstances in which we feel just completely bamboozled. Don't know what to do. I'm paralyzed here. I can't, I can't move. I don't know where to go, what to do. In truth, only God in heaven can reveal mysteries, as Daniel pointed out to King Nebuchadnezzar, because only God foreknows all things. Um, I love the statement in, uh, in Proverbs 16.33, where it's just a simple statement, but it, uh, when you think about it, it has profound implication. It says, the lot, dice, is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. We talk about the luck, you know, playing on the dice tables and rolling the roulette. Everything that, every decision that comes out of these things, God's known it already. He knows about it. Not a surprise to him. And if he knows that, he knows everything, which of course he does. The dead and unclean spirits do not have any special powers. They are limited in their knowledge. Without God's permission, the devil cannot do what he wants to do. Job 1, 7 through 12. Where have you come from, Job? Roving around the earth. Have you considered my, my servant Job a righteous and a holy man, a blameless man? Uh, oh yeah, he's only, he's only blameless. He's only serving you because you put a hedge around him. He's rich. Everything's gone well for him in his life. Everything has been perfect for him. Why shouldn't he serve you? You let some things go wrong now, and let's see, he'll curse you to, his fa to your face. So the Lord says, all right, he's in your hands, but you're not to take his life. And so the process of crushing Job started. But the, the point I'm trying to make is the devil couldn't do what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill him. Destroy him completely. But God said, no, you can't do that. But I'll let you test him. I'll let, let you tempt him, so to speak, because it will be a temptation when it comes from the devil. It's a test when it comes from God. When Samuel was brought up from the dead by the witch of Endor in uh, 1 Samuel 28, 7-19, uh, Samuel could only tell Saul what he already had told him during his lifetime. Because you have disobeyed God, the kingdom will be torn away from you. And you're going to die in this battle with the Philistines, you and your sons and Israel will be delivered into their hands. I don't know, this, this was Samuel coming back. It proves that we're still alive after we die. It also proves that the dead can't help us, and that if they were to speak, they can only tell us what we know already. There is one message from over the other side and that's in the story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man while he was in torment says, send Lazarus to tell my brothers not to come to this place of torment. So if you really want a message from the dead, that's it. Get your life together, pull yourself together, do God's will, finish out the course, go to heaven, and don't come to this place. It's hell. That's the warning from the other side, if you needed a warning from the other side. Talking to the dead is hocus pocus. P 
People need to talk to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He alone is the one who can deliver us from all our troubles and save us from our sins. All right, let's move on to superstition, God and superstition. <clears throat> Do you know what happens when people turn away from God? Well, let's remind ourselves from Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Beginning with verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonoured among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. <clears throat> Idolatry in all its forms facilitates what man wants. It makes him feel religious, even when he has forgotten God and is living exactly as he wants to live. But idolatry is a delusion. Isaiah chapter 10, 3 to 11. It's not the only passage that speaks about the delusion of idolatry. Idolatry. Isaiah chapter 10. Beginning with verse 3. But now, uh, what will you do in the day of punishment, in the devastation which comes from afar? To whom will you flee for help? Or where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains to crouch among the captives, but to crouch among the captives or fall among the slain. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is not outstretched. Um, I must have been asleep when I was writing this out, I tell you, or half asleep anyway, for sure. Um, let's see. Jeremiah chapter 10. <laughs> That'll help. Beginning with verse 3, he says, For the customs of the peoples are delusion, because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they. they and they cannot speak. They must be carried, because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm nor can they do any good. It's just, I know Isaiah talks about take a piece of wood from the tree, the stump of a tree, cut it in half, make a fire out of one part of it, make your food on that fire, and then make the other part of the tree into a god and bow down and worship it. That's the folly of this idolatry thing. We think there's power in that piece of wood. We call it our God. Or a piece of plaster. Or a piece of, of some metal that's been formed in some sort of image. Not in the image of God. Not even in our own image. But in the image of animals. Four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We make them their, our God instead of God. How far we have fallen when we involve ourselves in idolatry. John tells the Christians, my little children, guard yourselves from idols. And there's a warning in it. 
don't boo-hoo like, oh, oh yeah, that, everybody knows how stupid that is. Not, I'd never get myself involved in that. Yeah? We'll see in a minute whether you will or not, or do or not, or have or not. So, the, the other thing about superstition is it gives rise to false prophets who were fond of telling the people what they wanted to hear for a price, of course. Now, dreams were, a part, were part and parcel of the lying prophet's portfolio. And I'd like you're in Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah 23 now, beginning with verse 23. People are spooked by dreams. Even now, we have a bad dream and we wake up shaking and we can't get it out of our heads. We feel scared. What if you were living in a society where dreams were so important that they really meant something? Then how much more scared would you be under those circumstances? He says in verse 23, I am God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long is there anything in the heart of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of, the, of Baal. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord. Of course, these false prophecies are the straw, and God's word is the grain, the real substance, the real nourishment. <clears throat> is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues to declare the Lord declares... Behold, I'm against all who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boastings. Yet I did not send them or command them, or, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord God. There were prophetesses who were particularly singled out in Ezekiel 13, they were, wore armbands or scarves or whatever, and they were able to put a curse on the people, and the people got, were killed as a result of it. Killed as a result of it. Just imagine the fear that generated, and the power that it gave them. You could buy somebody's death through a curse which they would pronounce. But God saw what they were doing too. And he condemned it. And he punished them for it. We're not to fear him who can kill the body. We are to fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus said to Doubting Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There simply is no other way of being saved, either in this life or in the next. All right, to think that physical objects have the power to bless or curse or our lives is superstition at a bovine level, 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 I should say. In times past, household idols gave people a very private means of consulting the spirit world about all their worries and problems. And the incident of Rachel stealing her father's household god is interesting. No doubt she thought this is um, going to benefit us. The household God I can consult. The household God will bring blessings for us. The household God will make me fertile. The household God will, is, the, is the answer for the things of this world. But she needed to learn. She needed to trust God rather than a household or a God. When one becomes a Christian, he must turn away from the idea that there are lucky numbers. What's your lucky number? 
to have a lucky number, don't you? You could say it right now if you wanted to, but you don't need to say it. Just keep it to yourself. It's not lucky for you because you're unlucky having a lucky number. Uh, we need to turn away from lucky numbers or charms. In truth, a St. Christopher's medal cannot save you from an accident. Even if you have it hanging up in your car behind the mirror. There's no such thing as a miraculous medal that can ward off evil. So it's no good pinning it to the, pa to the baby's clothing. Wearing a crucifix will not save your soul. There's no power in objects to do anything, good or bad. They are just objects. They are not living things. And the so-called powers that might inherit these or, or inherit these objects are just have not got the power that humans deem them to have. They have not got the knowledge that humans believe that they have. They are under God's control. And God will either permit or deny them the right to do what they want to do. Sorcery is a work of the flesh. Secretly is an attempt to circumvent God and his word. But through Christ we have crucified the flesh and its lusts. Therefore walk like King Joshua by removing from all contact uh, or removing from our lives all contact with the occult and its hocus pocus trappings. I think that's the lesson. The whole, the whole thing is, is, is important to the man who's turned away from God, who doesn't believe that God's in control, who doesn't believe that God is all-knowing, who doesn't believe that God can deliver us by his power. It is the person who's on his own in life and wants to be on their own in life, their own little king in their own little kingdom. They want to have access to so-called so powers or, or secret knowledge so that they will be able to influence the world around them and control things. Uh, and they become superstitious and paranoid and it leads to all sorts of terrible things in our societies and in our lives. And if you ever really want to know the difference between Christianity and the occult, look at the places in the world where the occult is prevalent. And look at the places where Christianity has had some influence. Is that not convincing enough? I'll leave it with you. <laughs>